Bye.
Created for purpose, a unique genetic blueprint from the moment of conception. DNA woven together to determine gender, eye color, hair color, fearfully and wonderfully made. Valued beyond measure. Our culture says life is disposable, her rights matter most, it's not really a baby. And it's all one big choice. But God created us in his own image and whispered, I have called you by name, you are mine. In the United States, abortion is legal throughout the entire pregnancy, totally unrestricted. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference for life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? There are over 2,700 pregnancy centers in the United States serving men and women free of charge and full of hope, providing pregnancy tests, life-affirming counsel, abortion recovery, classes, clothing, and diapers. Many centers offer the first glimpse of a woman's baby in the womb displaying the magnificence of creation and the precious beats of a tiny heart, perfectly formed and fashioned by the one who created them. They serve faithfully, love well, encourage, they are hope dealers. They need volunteers, your prayers, and your financial support. Will you please give generously and help make a difference for life today? Let's all stand together and we're going to pray and then we're going to worship and sing praises to our God because he's worthy. Bow with me, please. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can rest in the knowledge that nothing escapes your knowledge or your power, that you're in perfect control and we can be at perfect peace. Thank you for your goodness. As we worship you, be glorified. You are worthy to receive all praise and honor and glory both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus our life. No other name on earth can save, can raise a soul to life. He opens up our eyes to see the harvest He has grown. We labor in His fields of grace as we lead sinners home. Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine for thee. Song to 
Because I think we've lived in some disappointing, fearful, scary days full of change. And this last verse was especially comforting to me as I was singing through it. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on, when we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past. All safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. I hope this song is a comfort to your heart in these days when we need comfort for our hearts. Be still, my soul.
peace that you give us. Holy Spirit, we want to thank you when you flood into our hearts and you assure our souls that we can be still and see and know that you are God. Help us during these times of change, these times of pandemic. Help us to trust you. Help us to know that this has not taken you by surprise and you're not worried. And help us to know that even death from a virus is not the worst thing that could happen, that we have eternal hope in Christ. And that's all we need to concern ourselves with. Help us to trust you. Thank you for uh, stilling our souls and for quieting our minds. And I ask that you would do that once again here before the message and speak to our hearts through the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you grab a seat, why don't you turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. Next week, Fawn and I will be gone celebrating our 20th anniversary. And so, her daddy, thank you, her daddy, Howard Gordney, is going to be here preaching. They're going to be keeping the kids. And I um, just want to let you kind of know what's going on. So, this morning's message is kind of standalone. And then when I get back from vacation, we're going to begin a line-by-line, precept-upon-precept study through the book of Romans, and I'm looking forward to that. I've done a, a lot of reading in the last couple of months trying to prep for that. I don't know if I'm any more prepared than I was a few months ago, but I'm really looking forward to it with a lot of anticipation. So hope you will uh, join us for that in a couple of weeks. Um, so as I said, this morning's message is a, a little bit of a standalone, and it, I, I want to try to address something that I sense that is simmering under the surface that we in the church don't like to talk about. We see it in culture, we feel it in ourselves, we, we acutely feel it in our own minds and our own hearts, but... Regardless of the reason, we don't, we don't really like to, to talk about it, and that is this idea of discouragement. And I want to be intellectually honest here. I want to be emotionally honest here, and, and I don't want to catch you off guard, but I've, I've battled with that over the last couple of months. Anybody else? That, that the last six months have been particularly discouraging. And we were talking with some friends just this week, you know, that, that we've been through some deep water together. This body has been through some deep water together. But the last six months have been unique in the sense that they are discouraging. And, and even to the point that there have been some times over the last few months that I felt despair. Like, I, I wonder if there was ever going to be a way out. And it's not the virus. And it's not the violence. Because... Fawn already mentioned it. I'm not afraid of dying. It's living in this world that sometimes scares me. And that, that's really the hard part. I think God has given me, anyway, a, 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 a strong sense of dying grace. I think I could do that for the Lord, but... I don't know, I don't know if I can keep on living in this world sometimes. And... You know, the fact is, is that I've been on death's door before, and, and so have many of you, and 
And that doesn't worry me, but what's going on in our world right now is of great concern. Does anybody else feel that way? Yeah, hopefully I'm not alone in that. And it, let's just take what's going on in culture for an example. You know, that things are changing so fast, and there's no clear leadership, and there's no clear direction and then, if you'll permit me to just be bold, that we have these, this snake in the grass, sycophantic media that misrepresents the truth. And then we have these pedantic, suck up politicians that trample the constitutional rights of the very people they were elected to represent. And then you have these millionaire make believers and mask wearers that claim the moral high ground and they cram their unwanted opinions down our throats. In all of that, there's this vacuum of leadership. No one is willing to make a decision, yet everybody wants to be heard. And that even includes me and you sometimes, because we all have a platform to be heard through social media. And so perhaps a little closer to home, it's disheartening when there is no clear consensus for what hap happens next. And, and I, don't, I don't know if you've considered that lately, but I have. We've never been down this road before. There's no precedent. There's nothing upon which we can draw from history, no lessons that we can draw from history about how to handle what's coming next. Not in our country, not in my lifetime, not in my personal experience. And, and so it's discouraging. It's flat-out discouraging when every decision is questioned. And every action is disparaged. And every motive is maligned. And I'm not just saying that about myself. I'm saying that that is something that is happening all around us. It's dejecting when people give in to fear instead of living by faith. And I think that that, that may be what bothers me the most, especially about my own self. You can tell I've been in Arkansas for a while with my English, my own self. And, and the body of Christ that I pastor is that it is so easy to give in to fear right now. And, and oftentimes, we find ourselves choosing to live in fear rather than to live by faith. And it concerns me. It gravely concerns me because of what I expect to come next. That I think this is preparation for the end. And I'm not trying to be dramatic but I, I honestly, we know, reading the scriptures, that the worst is yet to come. And how quickly people who name the name of Jesus will abandon their faith because somebody told them to. Now, I, I'm thankful that salvation doesn't belong to me. I don't determine that. That belongs to the Lord. But you understand what I'm saying. It, it is completely disheartening when we choose to live by fear and not by faith. And, and so we have all of this tension. You know, why, why is your business even open right now? Or, or why is it not open? Why are you not wearing a mask? Don't you care about the lives of other people? Don't you care about your testimony? Why are you wearing a mask? Don't you care about your constitutional rights and freedoms? This is so inconvenient. I don't want to do this anymore. Back up. Social distance me, bro. You know, that we don't need more government interference. Where's my stimulus check? You, you see the tension and how disheartening this can be? And, and even from moment to moment, all of us kind of go back and forth on all of that. And, you, you know, there's some things about this that I absolutely enjoy. I really enjoy the person behind me at the grocery store having to stand six feet away. I love that. I hope we never go back from that. You know, no touchy. Just get back. But it's, and, and here's the thing. 
the further down the rabbit hole I go, the less and less favorable my reactions to everything that are, that's going on. And you're like me, that, that we get more and more frustrated and, and more and more put out and, and, and more and more inconvenienced by everything that's going on. And, and then we start, you know, like almost rebelling against it all and, and ignoring it all. And, and, and here's where we find ourselves. Here's where I find myself. That, that we live in a very discouraging time that calls for some desperate measures. There's an old Latin proverb that comes to mind here that extreme diseases call for extreme cures. Desperate times, discouraging times call for desperate measures. And that's where we find ourselves in our text. That's why we're in 1 Kings 19, because the prophet Elijah is battling some of his own disheartening discouragement. He's kind of at the end of his rope And I think that speaks to where we are right now. His circumstances were largely different than ours, but a a pattern emerges that will help us combat these discouraging times because as he faces his own discouragement, his reaction is much like ours. It's not the best. He doesn't respond to it well. But God graciously intervenes. And that's what I need. And I think that's what you need too. And so let's, let's read our text. If you're with me there in 1 Kings 19, these verses are going to be on the screen. We're going to read down through verse 18 together. I know it's a lot of verses, but let's just read these together and let's, let's begin to drill down on what's going on. Ahab, that's king of Israel at the time. The nation of Israel is split. We've got the northern tribes and the southern tribes. Ahab's king over the northern tribes. Worst king ever, like ever on the planet Earth. Worst king ever, okay? Ahab told Jezebel, his wife, worst queen ever, all that Elijah had done. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So what's she saying? I'm going to kill you. I mean, that's what she's saying. I'm going to kill you, buddy. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. So his bedtime prayer was that God would kill him. And he went to sleep. And then we read, As he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake of bread on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, that is, God said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of a cave. And behold, there came a voice to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. 
And the Lord said to him, Go, return to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abdel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So since Fawn has already prayed, let's just jump right in here, shall we? Because our circumstances are different, but we see a very discouraged man who is at the end of his rope, that desperately needs God to intervene in his circumstances and in his life. And by the way, those circumstances are beyond just personal. that They involve the entire nation of Israel. He desperately needs God to intervene, and God does. And so, as I said, a pattern emerges here, and I want us to just walk through that pattern because I believe it'll help you because it's helped me. And so the first thing we need to say from this text is that discouragement is, is almost always unexpected. We look at verses 1 and 2, and it, it is always unexpected. Sometimes it, it makes perfect sense because of what's going on, and sometimes it doesn't make any sense at all. And that's kind of where we find Elijah. No one ever wakes up in the morning expecting to be discouraged. You didn't wake up this morning thinking, you know what, I think I'm going to be discouraged today. That's, that's number one on my to-do list. Is that on your list? And I'm being a little sarcastic here to prove a point. No one ever expects it, especially not when things are going well. And that, if you look back to like March when all this started, none of us were ever expecting it. No one was looking for this. And even in the midst of it, I think no one was expecting the continual turmoil. I think all of us thought by now we'd be beyond it. We'd be past it. Didn't we? You go back up to chapter 18, and, and what we read in chapter 18 in 1 Kings might be the greatest Old Testament victory over idolatry. That Elijah stood alone against the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove against a, a vile queen, against a violent king, against a misled people. He was heroic. He stood them all down, him and God. And then when it came time to it, he took up the sword and, or the sword rather, and slaughtered them all. I mean, he was, a, he was a hero. And so it seems odd that in chapter 19, we would read about such discouragement on the heels of such a victory. How could it be that a man who could be so heroic and so courageous at the threat of a woman could turn tail and run and become so despondent? But in James chapter 5 and verse 17, we're reminded about something concerning Elijah, that he was just like you and me. That he was a man with the same desires and the same tendencies and the same pitfalls and the same temptations, just like you and me. And so for a moment, let's be honest, for a moment I think he lost sight of what God was doing. I think he focused on the threat that Jezebel made. That, that he got really engrossed in how bad things were. And, and maybe just like Peter who had enough faith in the moment to step out of the boat. When he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. And, and maybe that's where Elijah found himself. He just took his eyes off of Jesus for a minute and he began to sink. And so discouragement is, is never really expected, especially on the heels of a great victory. And I want to say this before we move on. It's easy for us to fall into the same pattern. That, that we can focus on government because when, when Elijah was focused on Jezebel, he was focused on the government. We can do that. As a matter of fact, I think, I think maybe we have. Haven't we? And that, that we can concentrate on our emotions. That we can get really engrossed and wrapped up in how bad things are and how bad we feel. And 
the reality is that, that as we're doing that, we have faith, but maybe we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and we're beginning to sink. I feel that way. And so the reality is, from the text, discouragement is almost always unexpected, and then nobody ever wants it either. It's always unwanted. Nobody ever desires it. Verses 3 and 4. Look there with me at, at those verses, and you see there under his lonely juniper tree, Elijah gives in to the weariness of his soul, and he just wants it to stop. And so he cries out for death. His bedtime prayer is for the Lord to take away his life. He's had enough, and death would be easier than continuing to live in his world. And, and sometimes, none of us ever like to admit it, but sometimes we feel that way. And let's be honest. Many, many, many heroes of the faith have found themselves in that bottomless low. That Job and Moses and David and even Jesus came to the point where they just wanted it to stop. I mean, you don't think Jesus felt this way? What about the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed for the Lord to take the cup of his suffering away? That, that he was so earnest in that moment that the capillaries in his skin broke and his blood or sweat became blood. He wanted it to stop. And that so, so what is the reality then for us? It wasn't because they were faithless or manic. I think especially in Elijah's case, he just was tired. And he wanted some relief. That he was tired of fighting against Ahab and tired of facing Jezebel and, and just tired of running, tired of hiding, tired of being tired. You know, and, and that's, maybe that's where you find yourself because that's where I find myself. I'm just kind of tired of it all and I kind of just want it to stop. And just wanting it to stop doesn't make you a quitter any more than your desire for relief makes you a quitter. I don't think Elijah was a quitter. I think he was tired. I think he wanted change. I think he wanted to see God change the heart of the king and the queen that, that he knew the nation of Israel had abandoned the Lord and he wanted them to come back. That was his job as a prophet to turn the hearts of the people back to God. He wanted it to change. Isn't that where you find yourself? And I'm not just talking about the virus, and I'm not just talking about the violence. I'm talking about the millions and billions of people that need to be brought into the kingdom. And we just, I look out at our culture, and I, like you, just, I want it to stop. I'm ready for a change. Aren't you? That I, I don't want this anymore. And, it, and, and I'm not just talking about the inconvenience of wearing masks and not being able to go where I want to go and do as I please. That I, I can live with that. I don't want to deal with all of the nonsense behind that. And, and, and it, maybe that goes without saying, so I'll just leave it there. But I'm, I'm ready for a change. Aren't you? And, and so because we find ourselves here, with unexpected, unwanted discouragement, we desperately need God to intervene, don't we? And that's exactly what we see in the text. God intervenes for Elijah and provides him with sustaining strength, verses 5 through 8. So Elijah sits down, falls asleep, prays for God to take away his life, and I think it's noteworthy that in the throes of despondency, God does not rebuke him. Do you notice that? He, God does not rebuke Elijah for being discouraged or even running from his circumstances. That, that he kindly lets him rest. He lets him sleep for, for probably what amounts to two days. He lets him sleep. And, and, and I can hear Jesus' words to his disciples in Mark chapter 6 and verse 31, come apart and rest a while. They didn't even have time to eat or to rest. And Jesus says, come away with me. 
and let's get some rest. And then God graciously gives him something to eat. God knew that he needed rest and he needed food. That, that in order to keep going, Elijah needed to take in because you can't get water out of a dry well. No matter how hard you pump, there's no water because the well's dry. Are you with me? And so Elijah needed to be fed and he needed to rest. And so Elijah eats and then he goes back to sleep. But because the journey was so great and the task was so great, God feeds him a second time. And so it's significant then that that the rest that God allows him to have and the food that God gives him to eat, he's able to go and be sustained for 40 days and 40 nights and travel over 100 miles on foot on what God provided for him. It's also significant that that journey that was too great for him brought him to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Mount Horeb is significant geographically and spiritually. That, That is where... God first appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 in a bush that burned with fire. Where God first spoke to Moses and called Moses and sent him back into Pharaoh to demand the release and redemption of God's people happened right there at Horeb. It would be at Horeb that God would assemble Israel and come down and, and Mount Horeb would quake at the presence of God and would be shrouded in smoke because of the glory of God. And God would hand over to Moses his law in the Ten Commandments. Right here at Horeb. It is significant that at this same spot, Elijah's calling would be renewed. His sense of purpose would be renewed. That God intervenes and doesn't just allow Elijah to rest and he, and he gives Elijah time to take in and receive nourishment and strength so that he could keep going. But God also renews his calling and his purpose. And so hear me, listen to me, loved ones, because this is what I need, and I'm assuming that you need it too. When you're discouraged, our gracious God is not going to rebuke you in your discouragement. That's not his way. Amen? Thank you, Lord. It's okay with him if you rest a while. It's okay. He knows what's coming. And he knows what you need. And he'll provide it for you so that you can make it. Thank you, Jesus. And, and by the way, he's going to give you what you need so that he can bring you to a place where your calling and your purpose can be renewed. And, and by the way, what does that mean for us as a church? Do you know... <clears throat> That in all of this, and and with everything having been stripped away, all of our priorities have kind of realigned and snapped back into focus. And and I felt like we were pretty aligned in the first place. But one of the gracious things our kind Heavenly Father has provided for us in the last six months is a renewed sense of purpose and why we're here. All of the peripherals, really no longer matter. It's, and it's not that they weren't good or they didn't provide us with any benefit. We can only do what we can do now. Agreed? God has, has brought us to a place where our calling and our purpose have been renewed. And I'm trusting, I'm trusting that He will do that in my personal life just as He will in yours. That the, the The journey that is ahead of us is too great for us. Do you know what that means? That means that you can't get where God needs you to be in your own strength. In our own strength, we'll lie down under a broom tree and pray for it all to end. But in the strength that God provides, the nourishment of His Word, and the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit, God will bring us where we need to be. Amen? We need that. God will intervene. And we can trust and have faith that he will do that for his own glory and for our good. Amen? And and so I find it also interesting as we continue to put all of this together that as God intervenes and provides sustaining strength for a journey that is too great, he also invites us to pour out our hearts to him. Verses 9 and 10. That, That Elijah takes up residence in a cave 
And in the cave, hiding out, still alone, God asks a probing question. What are you doing here? Now, don't you think that that's because God didn't know what was going on? Nothing escapes his sight, right? That, that God knows everything. That question wasn't for God to find out something that he didn't already know. That question was specifically for Elijah. And so here's my assessment of that question. This isn't a summons to judgment. This is a kind invitation for Elijah to bellyache. That, that God is inviting Elijah to pour out his heart to him. And so Elijah does just that. His complaint gushes forth. And, and yes, his tone of self-pity may seem a little bit out of character, especially considering the events of the previous chapter and all that God has already provided. It is self-evident that God loved him and still cared about him, that God obviously still needed him and wanted to preserve him for his future task. And yet, he still complains and I think that's important. And I'm not saying that as an indictment against Elijah. Because David made an art form of that in the Psalms. That, that God is inviting Elijah to pour out his heart to him. And so he does. And just as God didn't rebuke Elijah for needing rest, he does not rebuke him for needing to vent. This is important. Because if you're like me, sometimes I struggle with venting in prayer. That I, I, I think that I have to say the right things in order to be heard. When God is inviting me to pour out my heart. Just like he is inviting you. Just like he invited Elijah to pour out his heart. And so, let's be real. Sometimes we need a good gripe session. Don't we? I do. And so do you, whether you know it or not. Sometimes I like to bellyache. I just don't do it with the right people. You understand what I'm saying? If you do it with the wrong people, you leave your garbage in their garden. But if you pour out your heart to the Lord, that unclutters your mind. It unburdens your spirit. It helps you see what God wants you to see. That's why God invites us to do this. God wants Elijah to pour out his heart so that he can see what God wants him to see. And the same invitation is extended to us in the midst of all of this garbage. God wants you to pour out your heart so that you can see what he wants you to see. And as I said, David made an art form in this in the Psalms, and so maybe the challenge for us is to stop worrying about saying the right things and just get it out. That, that we are free to complain to God. Because that, that's what Elijah did. God, I'm alone, when he really wasn't. And Israel has forsaken your covenant and they've thrown down your altars and they've killed your prophets and, and yeah, that was accurate. But he's just pouring out his heart. God, I don't like this. This isn't right. You need to do something. Maybe it's time we start praying that way. Hello? Hello? Instead of, forgive me, but instead of just taking our shopping list or our laundry list, all of the things we want God to do and all of the, the things we want God to clean up, we just need to pour, our, our, pour out our hearts to the Lord. I think maybe, maybe God is allowing this to continue and all of these circumstances to linger because he's still waiting for us to really talk to him. Don't you know that's true? That, that he's still wanting us just to talk to him. And that, that the lesson to be learned has yet to be learned. That, 
that we still need to learn how to, to really, really pray and pour out our hearts to God. So God intervenes in the midst of unwanted and unexpected discouragement. He invites our heart, uh, us to pour out our hearts to him. And then he reminds Elijah that he's not alone because that's how he felt, right? And look at verses 11 through 14. He reminds Elijah that he's not alone. And so in verse 11, he tells Elijah to go and stand before the Lord. Again, not a summon to judgment here. But it is a, a come unto me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That he is inviting Elijah into his presence. And so we're not alone because God is with us, right? That every weary and languishing soul is satisfied and rep replenished in the presence of God. Jeremiah 31, 25. And not only is God with us, but he is at work in us. That's what the earthquake and the fire and the whirlwind, that's what that's all about. That, that God is reminding Elijah that he's still at work, even though he might be working in ways that are unseen. That, that God has many tools. He does not lack any tool available to do his work. That, that he doesn't lack for means and methods. Sometimes he brings the whirlwind. Sometimes he brings the earthquake and the fire. But oftentimes, and most commonly, God's work is not done in big and noisy ways. There are times when he prefers a much more peaceful and quiet voice. Elijah was used to big miracles, wasn't he? I mean, if, if you back up again to the last chapter, that's just one of them that that, that as he challenged the prophets of Baal to a duel, if you will, on the top of Mount Carmel, that, that, that he sacrificed his own offering on the altar before the Lord and divided it and saturated it with water and prayed a simple prayer and God answered by fire and consumed the offering and the stones and the water. And God gave him the strength to pick up the sword and slaughter all the prophets. That God, Elijah was used to big miracles. Elijah was used to the whirlwind. And the fire. And the earthquake. Elijah wasn't used to the still small voice. And, and, and there are times, listen, there are times when I want big too. Man, bring the fire, Lord. You know, it's time for an earthquake, God. You know, let, let's see it. I, I could use some big right now. How about you? But, but listen to me. The church and the work of God doesn't flourish upon the fire and the earthquake and the whirlwind. It flourishes in the still, small voice of the Word of God working in people's hearts behind the scenes. That's where the work of discipleship takes place. That's how the kingdom of God marches forward and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so God is with us and he is at work in us. But then also God reminds Elijah that his people, God's people, are also with us. As important as God's methods and God's means are God's people. Elijah confessedly felt alone, just like you and I have felt in the last six months. But God graciously reminded him that he was not, in fact, alone. That there were multitudes of people who proclaimed a renewed faith on the top of Mount Carmel. And that, that God reveals 7,000 in verse 18 that have not bowed the knee to Baal nor, nor kissed him with their lips. God still had a remnant of 7,000 people in Israel. Not to mention the fact that there was brave Obadiah, an officer in wicked King Ahab's court who had sheltered God's prophets and protected them and provided for them. Chapter 18 and verse 3. And then what's coming is his newfound relationship with Elisha. El Elijah was in fact not alone. And so we can say this, listen to me. 
no matter how alone we have felt, and by the way, it was pretty lonely there for a while, wasn't it? When we were meeting at home, and, and, and I still feel disconnected in so many ways from the body of Christ. We are not alone. Look around you for a minute. That no matter what else is going on in our community, there is this going on right here, right now. And, and that there are people, saints of God, that have been equipped for the work of the ministry that are caring for their brothers and sisters in Christ within this body. And, and no matter what else is going on in northwest Arkansas, it's going on here. And, and that there are people back there in that children's church room right now that are ministering to children and, and, and people that are caring for toddlers in our toddler room and people who are ministering to young children in, in wee lambs. And there are guys out there roving the halls making sure that nobody sneaks up on us. And that we're safe. That, do you understand what I'm saying? That we're, we are emphatically not alone. Even though we feel that way sometimes. And, and, and then if you just lift your eyes just a little bit. There are fellow servants that are, that are outside of our church. And even outside of our denomination. That persevere in the work that are out there trying to make disciples, that are proclaiming God's word, that are being a voice of truth, we are emphatically not alone. Amen? And so if you're discouraged, know this. God is with you. That, that He is working in you and in His body. His people are with you and you are not alone amen and then finally let me give you this last little tidbit as we're uncovering this pattern here to combat our own discouragement is that god gives elijah a job and so god's work becomes incredible therapy when we're discouraged and i'm not just talking about any work here because you know you can go out and pull weeds and be distracted God's work is incredible therapy. You look at verses 15 through 18. God gives Elijah time to rest and to eat and to vent, and then he gives him a job to do. Don't you think that's significant? That he gives Elijah a task, and then in that task, his dignity is restored, his sense of value and self-worth is found once again. He knows his life matters. That, that this man who wanted God to take away his life at the threat of his own murder now realizes that his life actually matters. And so no matter how despondent any of us have been over the last six months, you and I need to know that because we still draw breath, that there's a task to be done and because of that, our life matters. Are you with me on that? I hope you understand me here. Elijah had, important, had an important task to do. The torch had to be passed. And so look back with me at the text. He had to uh, anoint the kings that God had sovereignly appointed to do his work. And, and yes, God sovereignly appointed and raised up kings just like he raised up prophets that that haziel king of syria had to be anointed and haziel would be a murderous wretch that he would slaughter god's people but god would raise him up to bring israel into judgment and that's a scary thought but elijah had to anoint haziel he had to anoint anoint jehu jehu was very much the same that you know he would slaughter Anyone who was a threat to his throne. It was very much a usurper. Not, none of the northern kings were from the line of David. But you understand, Elijah had to raise him up because anybody who, who, who that, that Haziel didn't take care of, Jehu would. And then there was Elisha, the prophet that would fill Elijah's shoes, the prophet of double portion, the prophet that would do exactly to the letter twice as many miracles as 
Elijah, and he would take care of anybody who was left. There was a monumental task to do. And so if he remained despondent and in a cave, he couldn't do any of it. Are you with me? He would be the one that missed out. It wouldn't be that God's work was was thwarted or, or that God's purpose would be halted or that God wouldn't take care of it through other means. Elijah wouldn't be used to do it. You understand? And, and that's where we find ourselves. You, if you decide not to do anything, okay, you're not going to stop God from finishing his work. You understand that? You're going to be the one that misses out. You're going to be the one left on the sidelines. And so if Elijah stayed in the cave, despondent, dejected, he'd miss out on it. He wouldn't be used to accomplish it, but the task was great. And so I I say all of that to kind of bring us around to the point. The work of God is incredible therapy. Many of the great achievements in the world were accomplished by people who were tired and discouraged but they kept putting one foot in front of the other. And they kept trying in the midst of failure. And, and they took time to rest and to eat and, and to, to, to take in so that they could continue to give out. And they kept going. And so I, I think that's a wonderful lesson for us because this season of life and ministry has so much been about what we couldn't do. Right? We've been told what we can't do. And yet, in the midst of all of that, we are reminded of what we should be doing. Right? Can I be honest with you? So much of the enumerations on my to-do list were just wadded up and thrown in the wastebasket. That that so much of what I depended upon to do ministry on a week-in and week-out basis were, were simply thrown out. They were unavailable. I couldn't do them anymore because this last season of life has been about what we couldn't do. And so in the midst of all of that, we had to, dare I say, pivot because that's the byword right now. And I, I have yet to have used that word until just now because I hate it, but it's what we did. And, and, and some of the things we kept doing because we had some things in place because of the work of some good people that we just kept on going and we kept focusing on that. But then some other things became an eternal reality for all of us. All of a sudden we realized how important our small groups were because if we couldn't meet together corporately like we're doing right now, then man, those small groups are almost a non-negotiable. And by the way, if we live in the generation where persecution arises against the American church, then you realize how important those things are going to be going forward. That, that, that there, if there is a time when we can't meet together on this property and it is confiscated by the government, then, and we will have to meet in house churches, how important that pattern is from Acts chapter two to the way we do ministry right now. That, that we must devote ourselves to the same kind of tenets that they did, to, to the prayers and, and to the apostles' doctrine and to the breaking of bread and to the fellowship. And, and, and there in that environment where persecution came up against the church that God added daily those who were being saved, that, that the work of God did not stop because they didn't have a big building and a, a big program and a, a big worship service, that, that it grew exponentially because what God did in that environment and i say all of that to say that the work of god is incredible therapy that that we're those of you who are faithfully serving and pouring your life into other people and faithfully showing up and 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 you don't know how you don't know what's coming and and i don't either you don't know what next week is going to look like or when the kids start back to school or what our small groups are going to look like we don't know what might happen next week because of the mandate but we're going to keep going. We're going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. We're going to keep serving because, man, the the work of God is incredible therapy, right? And so it's been very encouraging to see over the last several months 
what really matters bubble to the surface. And it's been more than a little fun to try some new things. And, and even though I'm not willing to sacrifice everything upon the altar of new, I think there are some sacred things about the church that need to be held on to. But God has more work for us to do. You know that, right? And there's an incredible amount of work for us to do, and the task is great. And so we need to get to it. Amen? That, that we're at a place, no matter what you feel about the pandemic and the government and what is going on socially and, and even no matter what is going on internally in our own emotions and in our own hearts and in our own minds, we're at a place where the task is great and no matter how we feel and no matter what we see, we got to get to it. That we cannot afford to abandon the work of the Lord. And yes, you have the freedom to do so, but you will miss out on what I believe as persecution arises and things may get worse culturally and politically and socially, we also may see another great awakening. Would to God that it be so. And millions of people come into the kingdom and I don't want to miss out on that. The task is great. And so we got to get to it, loved ones. If this at all resonates with you, and I hope that it has, I want to invite you to do what God did through Elijah and how Elijah responded to God. I want, I want to invite you to get some rest if you're tired. It's okay if you need to rest a little while. You take in, get, get fed, because what's coming is too great. You can't do it on your own, and neither can I. God knows that. He's going to provide for you exactly what you need. So go ahead and get some rest and take in so that you're prepared for what's coming, okay? And then you pour out your heart to God. Everything that's bubbling up inside of you, you just get it out. You, you Get it out. Pour out your heart to the Lord, but... But here's the thing, none of us can stay there. If we're tired and we need to be fed and we need to gripe, that's good. Let's get it out. Let's get it over with. Let's take in. But we can't stay there. We cannot stay in the cave. After we take in and after we pour out our hearts to God, we got to get to it because the task is great, loved ones. We can't stay there. We have to move. And so if this at all resonates with you, do what Elijah did. Get some rest. Take in. Pour out your heart to God. But then let's get to the work. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, help us as we, we pray through this and we bring this to a close. Thank you for not rebuking us when we're tired and when we're discouraged. Thank you for providing for us rest. Rest is a weapon. It's part of our armor. Thank you for providing for us the food spiritually that we need for the journey ahead. God, I know there are people here in this room like me and there are people here that are tuning in online that, that they need to take in because what is coming is too great. What you're going to do in our church and in our community in the days ahead, I believe, is, is too great. The, the, the trials that we are going to face are too great and the work is too great for us to handle on our own. And so, Spirit of God, nourish our hearts. Strengthen us for the days ahead and the task at hand. God, help us to pour out our hearts to you. And while I, I will not do that now, God, we need you to intervene. Please, please intervene, not just on our behalf, but 
for the sake of those who need to hear. Draw them to faith in Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. May we repent of all of the things that we have trusted in and looked to for guidance and strength and protection. Father, help us to trust in you and get to the work. Thank you for the task that you've given us. Lord, we praise you for that. It, it gives us a sense of worth and belonging and value. We're not alone. So help us, Lord, to band together, to stand side by side, and to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Help us to do that, Lord, together. In Jesus' name. I want us to stand to our feet this morning. Vaughn's going to sing through a verse of invitation. And if this has resonated with you, I want you to do one of a couple of things. I, I want you to sing with her, with all your heart, as you respond to the Lord and what God is doing in your own heart right now. I want you to pray. Maybe this is your time to get it out. We haven't opened the altars, but if you need to come this morning, be respectful, social distance, whatever, but... Why don't you come pour out your heart to the Lord? If that's you this morning, why don't you do that? Just get it out. Maybe your commitment needs to be renewed. Maybe you need to decide that you're just going to be a part of the solution instead of complaining about all the problems. And so whatever God is leading you to do, I want you to do that right now as Fawn sings and others pray. Let's close out our service in worship. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast, he will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last but by him such a cost he will hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast, raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast, till our faith is turned to sight, when he comes.
Be encouraged, loved ones. Let us be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Grace and peace, you are dismissed.